we've got two past the, the half hour here, so we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome, everyone, to the July All-America City Promising Practices webinar with a focus on diversity, inclusion, and racial equity efforts in local government. Thank you all so much for joining us. I'm Sarah Lipscomb, the Program Director of the All-America City Wards and Community Assistance. And I'm joined by my colleagues, Carla Kimbrough, the Program Director of Racial Equity, and Rebecca Trout, our membership coordinator. Um, we are with the National Civic League. We're a nonprofit who's been around since 1894, um, and we will work to advance equity in uh, communities around the country through engagement. I think either Darlene or Nolan, we're getting some feedback from you. If you wouldn't mind muting yourselves, that would be great. Thank you. Um, so the National Civic League uh, is a nonprofit, and one of our main programs is the All-America City Award. And the goal of this webinar series is really to promote efforts around the country that are doing innovative and impactful things around civic engagement and promoting equity. So we are very thrilled today to have with us some amazing speakers. We're going to be starting with Nolan Atkinson um, in the city of Philadelphia's first Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer, um, and he will be focusing on the uh, diversity and inclusion approaches, and then we'll be followed by Darlene Flynn, who's going to be focusing on the racial equity strategies um, in local government, and she was previously with the City of Seattle and is now in Oakland. I want to just briefly mention, um, as I said, the All-America City Award is our main program, um, and we just wrapped up a very successful year uh, for 2018 a few weeks ago, and of course, we're already hitting the ground running for 2019. Um, and so you'll see here that the theme is creating healthy communities through inclusive civic engagement. The application is available um, online right now, and uh, we've got a lot of resources in the application as well, I think including some of Seattle and Oakland's uh, racial equity work. So we're very glad uh, to have this topic highlighted today. Um, but I encourage you all to download the application and um, take a look to see if you think your community would be a good fit, um, especially if things in this webinar are really connecting with you. Uh, we encourage you to uh, apply for your with your great work through the All America City Award program. So with that, we'll go ahead and move to our speakers. Uh, we will be starting with Nolan Atkinson. Nolan. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Nolan Atkinson uh, from the uh, city of Philadelphia, uh, and. We'll begin by saying that I became the Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer uh, at the uh, appointment of Mayor Jim Kenney uh, back in January of 2016. Uh, for someone who's had a long career uh, as a lawyer, uh, this was my first full-time position in government. I had practiced uh, as a trial lawyer uh, for at least 45 years, uh, as, and that is how I spent my professional career. Today, I'm going to try and provide uh, you with some lessons learned uh, in connection with diversity and inc inclusion uh, over my time in the legal profession. And uh, for that reason, I'm going to go back in time a little bit and tell you uh, a little bit what I did as a lawyer and some of the things I saw uh, as a uh, lawyer uh, uh, during that time period. Uh, uh, slide, please. There we go. Uh, between 1991 and December 2015, um, I practiced law at the law firm of Dwayne Morris, which is a corporate lawyer, a law firm, excuse me, of well over uh, 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 700 lawyers, uh, and many of its clients are uh, what are commonly known as Fortune 500 uh, uh, companies. 
uh, I um, had been practicing law for a long time uh, prior to the time that I went to Dwayne Morris, and I wanted to sort of point out uh, how I got to Dwayne Morris uh, and uh, what I had done previously. Uh, so with that, I want to go to the next slide. There you go. In 1976, uh, we formed the law firm of Atkinson and Archie. Uh, there you'll see a picture of Bob Archie uh, and myself uh, practicing uh, law as a minority law firm uh, and one of Philadelphia's only minority law firms in uh, 1976. Uh, that wanted to service uh, clients, sophisticated clients, uh, in the field of bond work and complex uh, litigation. Uh, we felt that there was a need in the community uh, for a sophisticated firm with lawyers of color, and that was why uh, that uh, firm uh, was created. We practiced there uh, uh, as a law firm for 15 years and had all sorts of experiences uh, while there. Uh, fortunately, uh, during the time that we operated uh, Atkinson and Archie, the American Bar Association uh, passed something known as Goal 9, uh, which uh, states, quote, promote full and equal protection in the legal profession by minorities. Uh, that was promulgated uh, in the mid-80s, and it gave us an opportunity because of Goal 9 to seek out uh, clients uh, that were of a national scope uh, and provide uh, legal representation uh, to such clients uh, automobile agents, uh, automobile companies, uh, major uh, electrical companies, large corporations. It gave us an opportunity as a result of Goal 9 uh, to represent them and to, to build our uh, law firm. However, in 1991, uh, about, we decided to uh, uh, to merge our practice. And one of the major reasons why that occurred was we found that we were having difficulty attracting more uh, lawyers of color to our firm of Atkinson and Archie. Uh, what we learned and found was that because the legal profession was becoming more diverse, Large corporation, large corporate law firms were able to attract graduating law students into their much larger uh, uh, corporations and firms than we could attract as a small uh, law firm of 10 uh, persons. So we found that we could not actually build the minority law firm because of economic circumstances, as well as others, which were uh, prohibiting us from getting the kind of clients uh, that we hoped we could get. Now, could you go back to the previous slide, please? So for that reason, uh, we joined uh, Dwayne Morris. We, we merged all, all of the lawyers who were at Atkinson and Archie uh, which was a small number, uh, I believe it was seven at that time, uh, went to Dwayne Morris and we began uh, uh, corporate law. Uh, during my time at Dwayne Morris, uh, there were only less than 10 people of color in the entire firm. Uh, and I had been invited to sit on the hiring committee and also saw that uh, 
uh, law students who were being recruited to take a position in the firm when they graduated, uh, none of them were uh, of color. And so I went to the uh, chairman of the firm and said, we need to do something about that. Uh, he agreed, uh, and we uh, created uh, Dwayne Morris's first diversity committee, which began looking at some of the recruiting and hiring practices that were utilized. Uh, I went on from working with that committee to a point in time when the firm asked me to be uh, their chief diversity and inclusion officer. Uh, and at that time, I began to spend significant time while, practice, while still practicing law to advance diversity and inclusion and to bring in more diverse lawyers. Uh, when I left that firm uh, 25 years later, uh, we had grown from having less than 10 diverse lawyers to approximately 100 uh, diverse lawyers. Also uh, during that time, uh, I was instrumental in founding an organization known as Philadelphia Diversity Law Group, or PDLG, and that was designed to use some of the same practices we had used at Wayne Morris uh, and to invite other corporate law firms in the city of Philadelphia to begin to work on a sorry, concerted no effort. To yes. So sorry Hello. to interrupt. Um, if you are not speaking, if you can please uh, mute your phones. We're getting a lot of feedback. Sounds like a dog barking and some typing. Um, if you can please mute your line if you are not speaking. Thank you. Sorry, Nolan, please proceed. Okay. So uh, in, uh, so uh, uh, we started a, a, a group known as the Philadelphia Diversity Law Group, as I was saying. Uh, and now we have, uh, in Philadelphia, virtually every large law firm has, uh, uh, is a member of PDLG. This is designed to attract uh, uh, diverse lawyers uh, who have been recruited to work in law firms uh, to uh, continue to stay in Philadelphia to build successful careers. And I think I can report that the program was very successful. The, the final point that I want to make about my time uh, at uh, Dwayne Morris was that in 2010, uh, I decided to take on a case uh, which would, uh, which was about my great grandfather, George Vachon. Uh, George Vachon uh, was a man of the 19th century, graduating from Oberlin College uh, in 1841. Uh, he then went back to his home, which was in the Allegheny, Pittsburgh area of Pennsylvania and he uh, uh, began taking courses so that he could uh, become a Pennsylvania lawyer. Uh, when he applied to become a Pennsylvania lawyer, uh, his admission was denied because of race. This was in 1847. Uh, he went on uh, George Vachon went on to New York State and uh, uh, took their uh, bar admission requirements and was the first African-American lawyer in New York. And to make the story short, uh, he was the second African-American lawyer to uh, 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 be admitted to the United States Supreme Court and one of the first African Americans to be associated with Howard Law School uh, in the 1860s. He went back to Pennsylvania 
after all of these events in 1868 and applied again to be a lawyer in Pennsylvania and again for a second time was denied admission because of race. I filed a posthumous uh, petition with the Pennsylvania Supreme Court uh, for him to be admitted uh, as uh, a lawyer uh, and given uh, his bar admission and in 2010 that admission uh, was granted. Uh, George Vachon now holds certificate number one uh, in Pennsylvania as an admitted lawyer. Uh, that became uh, well publicized uh, and Dwayne Morris uh, holds annually a, um, a, a lecture series uh, to give uh, speakers an opportunity to talk about what they have done to brought, bring equal justice under, under law. So I just wanted to mention that as being one of my uh, uh, real experiences and, and lessons uh, that I've learned from, uh, 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 from spending so much time in the legal profession. So if we could go up two slides now. All right. So let me just sort of sum up about my career in the law uh, to tell you that the legal profession is one of the most uh, least diverse professions uh, in America. You, there, there are just not a lot of diverse lawyers who are really uh, practicing in the legal profession uh, in significant positions. Uh, why, why is that? I think one of the reasons is that the structure, structure of law firms, if you uh, look at them, is usually horizontal. Uh, and by that I mean uh, law firms have lots of partners. And each partner is responsible for uh, bringing in a certain dollar level of clients. And if uh, the lawyer doesn't bring in that level, uh, he's invited to leave. The, the system is the lawyer, the lawyers, the partners, they give out the work to the associates. And they are interested only in associates who can help them be more productive. Unlike a vertical system where everyone works for the CEO in a company, the legal system, because of this horizontal level, level is much more spread out. And because of that, Diversity is never the primary goal. The primary goal is for those partners to be more productive uh, and, to, and to drive uh, their uh, production and revenues at the greatest level. The so that has worked adversely for uh, lawyers of color. Uh, the final point is that recruitment is a long-term uh, project. It is, it's difficult and, and it is rigorous and because there are not a lot, a lot of people of color, there is a tendency for people to come to firms for two or three years and then feel like they're not getting any place and leave. So again, I say the legal profession is a difficult profession to work in. And so as the chief diversity and uh, inclusion officer for a large law firm, I constantly was dealing with these problems and trying to find ways of bringing more people of color 
inside <laughs> of the firm. Next slide, please. So after 45 years of working at the law, uh, hopefully with some success, uh, in December of 2015, uh, the mayor of Philadelphia, uh, Jim Kenney, uh, invited me uh, to join uh, his administration as a cabinet level officer and hold the title of Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer. The, uh, the scope of my duties are to address issues uh, of workforce diversity, uh, particularly for the exempt workforce. The exempt workforce are usually the highest level of, uh, of employees at the government. Uh, exempt means they're exempt from taking a civil service examination. And traditionally, uh, there was a um, uh, underrepresentation of people in, of color at the higher higher levels and highest levels of the exempt workforce. So one of my goals was to in increase <coughs> that level of diversity so that it looked like uh, uh, the population. Uh, when I say it, the city of Philadelphia government looked like the population of Philadelphia. Uh, we also are charged with the responsibility of improving the inclusiveness of the existing workforce through diversity and inclusion trainings. Uh, I go into virtually every uh, department uh, uh, and provide uh, introductory diversity <laughs> and inclusion. And we're presently in the process of developing a much more strategic plan to make sure that all of our 27,000 employees are in one form or another exposed to uh, diversity uh, and inclusion uh, uh, best practices. Uh, we also look at finding hiring disparities, uh, and that is primarily with the civil service workforce, the, those who are not exempt uh, but what can be done to remove barriers from pe preventing uh, people of color from rising and being promoted to the upper levels of those uh, positions? Uh, we oversee and um, uh, the, uh, the uh, OEO. Uh, which is the um, uh, organization uh, for economic opportunity in the city, and that's to make sure that city dollars are spent uh, equitably for minority and women-owned businesses throughout uh, the city. And if those dollars are not being spent equitably, uh, one of the things that I do along with the Commerce Department is to look for the reasons uh, why. Uh, finally, uh, my office has responsibility uh, for the Office of LGBT Affairs and the Office of Disability. These are oversight responsibilities, uh, but we spend a lot of time with both of those offices making sure that the services uh, that uh, are needed and required uh, are delivered. Uh, the um, next slide, please. So uh, quickly, uh, the uh, diversity and inclusion mission statement was one of the first acts by Mayor Kenny uh, after he took office. Uh, the uh, the goal of this was to embed principles of diversity and principles of inclusion uh, throughout the government. Uh, that mission statement, it's a little fine print to read, but I will just point out some of the important points of it. He wanted a government 
that mirrors the population of the city, which I've already said, uh, fosters principles of inclusion, addresses the needs of underrepresented people, and willing to partner with others in the private sector committed to increasing opportunities. Uh, those are the goals of the administration. Diversity is a pillar uh, of the, uh, of the uh, administration, uh, and we do everything we can to embed as a value diversity and inclusion. Uh, for example, uh, we've put out a list of diversity competencies uh, which are part of the job requirements for uh, any person who seeks to uh, apply for a leadership position in the government. They've got to know that there is a diversity and inclusion mission statement. They've got to know uh, what the uh, uh, values are of the Kenny administration and have a willingness to utilize that knowledge and build it as a competency in whichever department they uh, uh, administer, whether it's uh, uh, innovation and technology or streets or whatever, they uh, uh, diversity and inclusion is something we are uh, trying to brand throughout the government. Uh, I meet quarterly with every department and office head on an individual basis as to what their metrics, uh, their diversity and inclusion uh, metrics look like. Uh, and we are uh, constantly uh, looking for ways to uh, embed inclusion uh, throughout the government. Next slide, please. So uh, just trying to think about what might be some of the areas you might want me to talk about uh, very briefly uh, and why local government should concern itself with diversity, inclusion, and equity. Uh, first of all, for any municipality uh, which is an urban area uh, such as Philadelphia, uh, I can only stress that Philadelphia is a multiracial, multi-ethnic city, and it is vital that that government uh, looks similarly, uh, and uh, that all people within the government uh, are able to respond to the various issues uh, that uh, occur within a city. Uh, and to do that and to do it well, uh, inclusion and diversity are just vitally important. Uh, secondly, uh, I, I just would want to stress uh, that it is vital that that workforce that we have, and I think true in any city, uh, has uh, the kind of diversity and inclusion training so that uh, members of the government are able to quickly uh, and rapidly respond uh, to issues uh, that arise. All of you know that uh, Philadelphia was in the news some couple of months ago uh, when there was an issue with the Starbucks uh, restaurants. Uh, and that issue uh, was ultimately uh, addressed by Starbucks uh, providing for a half day uh, of inclusion training. Uh, inclusion training uh, can't, uh, can't remedy all of these issues because racism is ultimately uh, a cause of many issues, uh, but at least when there is inclusion training, you give your people an opportunity to think why they may have a particular bias and what they must do to overcome that bias. And uh, 
clearly, I think, uh, all of us as human beings have biases. The importance of training is to help us recognize what biases we have so that we can address them. Uh, finally, I haven't talked uh, much about our equity programs, uh, but uh, one of the things that we are doing with those uh, is to uh, foster uh, considerable uh, training throughout the government, and our goal with that is to embed equity uh, into our various programs. Uh, we're very focused and dedicate a lot of resources to equity programs, uh, and where we have started is by training our workforce. Uh, one more slide, please. So uh, let me just talk about what I think very briefly some of the achievements that we have done. Uh, one, you see a picture of the Philadelphia Workforce Diversity Profile Report. Uh, this report is uh, online, uh, so any member of the public can view it. Uh, for the first time in 2016, we produced uh, this work a diversity profile report, which will be an annual report. It gives all the metrics of who uh, uh, works in Philadelphia's government uh, and uh, what the racial metrics are, what the gender metrics are. Uh, it also points out some issues that we've had with salary disparities and how we can address those. Uh, a, another accomplishment uh, is uh, I think that we have generally raised the importance uh, so that it's on everybody's radar of inclusion practices, and I believe that people believe that that is something that is not wishful thinking but something that needs to be embedded as a value uh, in uh, the respective departments uh, and offices. Uh, just generally, as far as challenges, uh, city governments uh, basically face huge, huge problems, and basically the problems are bigger than the amount of resources that can be brought to address them. So we're always trying to address priorities. We don't always address the right ones, uh, but the goal is, is to make sure that we are being responsive and embed some very uh, important uh, principles into the values of the government, and that's what we're doing uh, with inclusion in government. Uh, the, the final point I would make is that in order to be successful with diversity and inclusion, there is a real need to communicate with all levels and all offices of government because on almost every initiative that you undertake, you have to have a partner, you have to have someone who is willing to work with you. None of us can do this work by ourselves. So I, I think I might have taken a little bit more than my 25 minutes, but I thank you for the opportunity of speaking. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Nolan, for joining us and for sharing your presentation at the National Civic League. Um, we definitely appreciate Philadelphia's goal of having the government mirror the makeup of your community, and um, we'll definitely be sending out that workforce diversity profile report. Um, we're really trying to push communities in that direction as well um, by measuring how equitable opportunities are in community by looking at things just like that, the um, leadership of a city, the vendors and contractors of a city, um, the boards and commissions of a city. So we really appreciate um, your forward work on that. Um, and we will go ahead now and pass it over to Darlene. Um, good, uh, good morning here on the West Coast. Good afternoon elsewhere. 
Um, thank you for having me on today. Can you tell me how much time I have now? Hello? You have, you have uh, just over 20 minutes. Okay. Well, I will dispense with some of this introduction. I, I am going to be sharing with you today a slide deck that um, is called from the work that we do with city staff here in the city of Oakland to set up our uh, advancing racial equity work. Um, it, we usually spend a total of about two days working on these components plus more details. So I'm going to do what I can in 20 minutes. Um, this first slide is one I often open with. Uh, this is a quote shown here, the arc of the moral universe may bend toward justice, but it does not bend on its own. This is President Barack Obama's twist on a theme that first emerged in 1853 from a Unitarian minister named Theodore Parker foreshadowing uh, the Civil War that was uh, coming upon the country. And I think that uh, I like to start with this slide because it immediately sets the historical context that practitioners uh, have come to understand as being important to advancing work. Being ahistorical causes us to lose track of what is the foundation of the problem, the root cause of the problem, and the history of resistance and work toward advancing the ideals that this country was founded on but has yet to live into with regard to equity and fairness and justice. So this calls upon us to remember that progress has been made, that the arc of the moral universe is bending toward justice, but that that has happened because people at various times in our history have placed their hand on that arc to move it in that direction. And this is our time. This is our turn and our chance to participate in writing this page of history with regard to racial progress in the United States. Next slide. Next slide, thank you. Next slide. Hello? Yes, I'm on your working assumptions slide. It was your next slide. I'm not seeing it. Okay, now I do. Um, there was one before that, actually. So, this is this work on equity is a continuation of the work that has come before. Uh, this this phase of race relations in our country has all happened within my working lifespan. Here, starting back in the 70s and following the civil rights movement, beginning with diversifying workplaces that had not previously been diverse with regard to race and gender. And then once they became diverse, recognizing that we had to work on the quality of the uh, of the experience in the workplace, and that meant looking at participation across identities and cultures. So we went from quantity to quality, and now we're moving into this next phase of equity and justice. And equity and justice, what equity and justice does is it puts the institutions themselves on the table, not just the individuals who are coming in or the individuals who are already there within the institution, but in fact, the institution's policies, practices, and procedures um, need to be brought into focus in order to ensure that they promote equitable outcomes. And as um, we heard from Nolan, there are areas of the, of the country and areas of professional endeavor that are still not particularly diverse. So there is still diversity work to be done. And of course, there's still inclusion work to be done. But the, the uh, benefit of having this third location or third leg of the stool, as I like to think of it, being equity and justice, is that even as we're now doing diversity and inclusion work, we know where we're going. We know that that's not the end of the story, that we're working for something beyond that that is much more profoundly impactful in people's lives. Next slide. I'm, let me know when you're there because it, I'm getting a delay. There we go. So you see up here in the upper right-hand corner, um, there's a cartoon that talks about thinking outside of the box. It's difficult for some people. It's actually difficult for all of us, and we'll talk some more about that in a minute, um, based on our socialization around race. So we begin from the very beginning to introduce some assumptions. Um, and the first one you see here is race matters. Almost every indicator of well-being shows troubling disparities by race. The city of Oakland has just released its equity indicators report that is a, a quantified uh, 
scorecard or dashboard about equity in the city of Oakland. Uh, and that study that we just completed um, absolutely made this point completely visible to people within the city government, community, and across the nation. Anyone can look at it by going to our website. These disparities are often created and maintained inadvertently, or maybe not, through policies and practices that contain barriers to opportunity for certain groups of people. It's only possible, it's possible and only possible to close equity gaps by using strategies determined through an intentional focus on race. This is because race gets in the way of advancing equity in any other area. Race is an over, uh, overarching factor that comes in on top of all other social locations that can create barriers for people in their lives, and then race adds more complexity to it. If opportunities in all key areas of well-being are equitable, then equitable results will follow. This is a simple logic statement. If, if equity is available, then equitable results will follow. Next one. It says, given the right message, analysis, and tools, people will work toward racial equity. Now, that doesn't mean all people will work toward racial equity, but we know that people will because people always have. Again, this quote that uh, began the presentation goes all the way back to 1853. People were thinking about moving justice forward, and that has been a continual process ever since then. And so it really does become about our pulling together um, and working collectively to bend that arc. These uh, assumptions were developed by the Annie Casey Foundation, Annie E. Casey Foundation, and they are the ones that uh, I access. There are other ways to put all of these ideas, but I appreciate the work that the Casey Foundation put into testing and developing these working assumptions because they are accessible and easy to work with even to those who are new to this kind of work. Next slide, please. The other thing about doing racial equity work is that we focus on systems, uh, not just individuals within institutions or in society, but systems, because systems produce certain outcomes as a result of their design. And this is just a graphic about the school to prison pipeline, a little bit, no details. It's just an opening slide to a larger presentation about that topic. But it brings into, into question how various structures and systems in our society are producing the outcomes that we are experiencing and that are impacting communities of color disproportionately on a daily basis. Next slide. So we grapple with from the very beginning when we're facing equity and change work or equity work that it is change work, that if we want to advance equity, we're going to have to change systems, not just the people in the systems, although they have to change too in order to be able to see the world differently and see the problem differently. What we are ultimately trying to do is change the system so that equity is the result. Next slide. So we work with an explicit definition of systemic and institutional racism, and that is a pattern of social institutions such as governmental organizations, schools, banks, and courts of law perpetuating negative treatment toward a group of people based on their race. Institutional racism leads to inequity, in opportunity, and in life outcomes. Next slide. So while we're looking at systems, we're also called upon to remember that we've all been socialized into this construct. It was this racialized construct that does not treat all groups fairly, was designed and put into place long before any of us that are alive today, we're here. It was waiting for us. We immediately got immersed in it, and we learned the system through our socialization. We learned it from families and peers and teachers who loved us. The learning was reinforced by social institutions and culture. Uh, we came to understand the current situation, the arrangement, as, as Dr. Powell likes to say, the current racial arrangement as normal. So we were fooled into silence and collusion and acceptance of things as they are. Underpinning all of this is plenty of fear, ignorance, prejudice, internalization, and disempowerment, along with violence to keep this system in place throughout the history of our country. That's the bad news, I guess. The good news is that it is completely possible to break out of this 
cycle of socialization through critical consciousness and action. And that's why we spend so much time talking about these principles that are different than what we would have learned in our standard education. We were not directed to think about or analyze the world in this particular way unless we were perhaps raised in a radicalized household or had some higher education available to us that unpacked these issues of um, racial constructs and gender constructs and other constructs that are built into our society and that ch channel people away from or toward opportunity. Next slide, please. So we've internalized a lot of racial distortions, uh, sometimes referred to as smog, uh, can think about it as a veil, but it causes us to not be able to necessarily see the world clearly and understand what is going on right underneath our nose. And if we had never seen a camel before, this view would mislead us quite greatly in understanding what a camel looks like. And the same is true for structural and institutional racism. Usually not, has not been pointed out to us in our um, development. And uh, we make assumptions, we fill in the blanks, we assume the world is the way it is because of reasons that have not been explained to us. Next slide. Ah. So what we do is we begin to unpack our understanding of race and, and the construct in this country by studying the history. Race, the Power of an Illusion is a very powerful three-part video series that was pr produced by PBS that unpacks the racial history of the United States and uh, pulls the veil back at least a little bit about how we got here. Next slide. The details of government participation in the construction of racial disparities is deep. These are a few examples of the way in which it took place. Of course, the genocide of indigenous people to, in order to seize the land that this country is built on, uh, slavery and the institution of chattel slavery that was invented in the United States and has never ended. Uh, the documentary 13th is excellent background on that statement that slavery has never ended. Uh, of course, our immigration policies that have always in this country tracked along with the need for cheap labor, building on the impacts of slavery, um, cheap labor extracted from other groups of people of color uh, and designed to fluctuate, immigration policy designed to fluctuate uh, to best serve the political and economic needs of the United States without giving access to uh, the, the people that were being, whose labor was being used without providing access to the benefits and privileges of citizenship. Um, and then down in the center of this slide, you see the red line map, the red lining map of the city of Oakland, Berkeley, Alameda, and surrounding towns. And that red lining uh, is the most recent iteration, or maybe not the, it's not really because immigration policy is still huge and impacting us greatly on a daily basis right now. But redlining um, put into place in geography a permanence of condition that every, uh, every city and uh, in the country is grappling with with regard to conditions now. So even though redlining happened back in the 30s and 40s and 50s, um, and the impacts of those policies were put into place then, the impacts are still being felt now. Next slide. Here's an example of that. This is a map of hazard, hazard disparities in Berkeley and Oakland, a contrast. Berkeley was an exclusionary community, very few people of color, very little red line area there. Oakland was uh, the recipient of many, many waves of people of color coming to this uh, East Bay here in California for various reasons over time. High populations of black and Latino people historically and heavily redlined, which has resulted in m much greater impacts of environmental hazards as redlined areas across the nation have always been seen as legitimate dumping grounds for all kinds of negative um, activities that have caused these areas to be particularly toxic for the residents who live there. And that is uh, still true today here in the Bay. It has also created extreme differences in poverty. It's the next slide. This is, a, this is Oakland's data that you're going to see on this slide, where you can see that um, African, one in, more than one in four African Americans in Oakley is, Oakland is likely to be living in poverty or is living in poverty currently, followed closely by Latinos at 21% living in poverty, so one in five, followed by Asians, 15% living in poverty, while whites living in poverty at 
in Oakland are at 8.4%. So these huge racial disparities follow the legacy of redlining and wealth building, um, which is the flip side of poverty, and re have resulted in recent times or been exacerbated in recent times by the impacts of redlining, exclusionary housing policy, banking, and lending practices. Next slide. I know I'm going really fast. Did that change? I'll just I'll flip through the paper here. Um, so the next slide is the worst thing about these disparities is not just the disparities. They're bad enough, and the impacts are devastating to communities of color. But um, the other part of this conversation is working to dispel the common narrative about those disparities. And that's why understanding the history of this country is very important. The dominant frame or the narrative, we call it, that we were taught or that we have absorbed from our society and that is spinning around us every day uh, on the, in the media and elsewhere is that these disparities are caused by individualism. There are winners and there are losers. And what determines winners and losers is a matter of personal merit or deficit. And people get what they deserve. Could you click again, please? This is um, backed with highly racialized assumptions about those, who the winners and the losers are. Next click. This is a complicated slide. This leads to no change. This attitude, this dominant frame or narrative leads to no change. And Dr. Powell says, this narrative will always produce durable, persistent, racialized poverty built around just accepting and tolerating a societal problem by framing it as an individual issue. So this doesn't work when we're doing equity work, but we have to recognize that this is the, this is the narrative that most people bring to a race conversation about or to a conversation about racial disparities. So we have to address it. We have to unpack it. Next slide. And the best way to address it is by replacing it with an equity frame or an equity narrative. The individual develops in the context of access to opportunity. Government has a role in addressing structural barriers, especially since government was very instrumental in building those structural barriers. We want to replace community marginalization with agency and recognize that communities, the people closest to the problem are probably closest to the solution, but they need government to remove barriers to implementing those solutions and um, that the community will be involved in solutions with the government's support through equity programming and equity uh, processes. Next slide. Mm. Oh, more clicks. What we're aiming for with this equity framework is transformation and nothing short of liberty and justice for all. So it's really not radical. This isn't a radical framework. It's a framework that is, again, focused on our highest ideals and what we say we are about as a nation. We, we want to have opportunity workshops that are high opportunity workshops in which people can build their lives that are available consistently to all of the residents of our country, not just to some. If you click again, I have a contrasting slide about the kind of opportunity workshop that is provided in disinvested communities who have been impacted by public policy such as redlining and um, other forms of bordering and exclusion from opportunity. So our job is to uh, change this picture without uh, impacting those communities with gentrification and displacement. So this is a tricky business. It is the hardest part of the work that we're doing here in Oakland right now because the pressure is so uh, great around housing costs and demands in the Bay Area that um, improvements in opportunity tend to foreshadow displacement and uh, gentrification. So that's something we are working with here while we're trying to figure out how to make sure that communities who have been historically kept away from opportunity get access to opportunity in place and, and not be displaced by the improvements that are coming. Next slide. So here are the equity change strategies that we're working with. Intentionally center a racial equity framework, change the narrative, build organizational capacity to make structural change in the institutions themselves, work closely with community most impacted by the disparities that we see, and use data equity impact analysis to advise changes in policies. I think there's one more. Work with urgency 
take strategic risks to advance equity. And of course, in a political environment, this can be, be very challenging, and yet it is necessary. It has always been necessary to changing and advancing um, our society around equity. Next slide. I wanted to give you one example of, of a piece of policy work that we've done recently. I have three minutes to do that. Cannabis uh, Race and Equity Program has gotten quite a bit of media across, uh, across the country, and you might have heard about it. If you haven't, you can certainly look it up. That work began by setting a racial equity outcome to promote equitable ownership and employment opportunities in the cannabis industry, to de de decrease disparities in life outcomes for communities of color, and to address the disproportionate impacts of the war on drugs in those communities. Was, that was then backed up by some data analysis, identifying equity barriers and opportunities, and um, recommending strategies to remove those barriers. Next slide. So some of the data we looked at was uh, analyzing cannabis arrest disparities here in Oakland for the last 20 years. On the left-hand side, you see the disproportionality in arrests, upward of 81% black, and on the right, in the right-hand pie chart, you see the mix of population in Oakland, which is much more even between black, Latino, or Hispanic, and white. So huge disparities in the arrest of black people in Oakland over the 20-year period that followed the legalization of medical marijuana in California. Um, so what's going on here um and it was it, this was where we began to think about what the government's responsibility is and what we had to do with creating and furthering the disparities in communities of color through this activity next slide while we were working with the white activist uh cannabis community here in oakland over that same period of time in a very tolerant environment uh, completely hand in hand uh, out in the open, this is Oaksterdam University, very visible brick and mortar uh, university for cultivating and growing cannabis, um, which was being done over that 20 year period largely illegally because the use of medical marijuana was legalized, but not the cultivation and manufacturing of products related to it. And yet those, the dispensaries were well supplied by uh, people that were building businesses in this environment uninterrupted by police enforcement and uh, incarceration. So we had two cities, basically, around the cannabis industry for 20 years. Uh, next slide. What we did then was identify what barriers and, uh, to opportunity emerged as a result of that history. We had an unequal starting line for communities of color that were being policed. Criminal records could keep them out of the business. In some other states, they did. Access to startup capital was difficult for them because they came from marginalized, impoverished communities, and you can't get a bank loan for a cannabis business. Uh, access to business space is very difficult here because of the cost of real estate, technical resources, legal business practices, records, accounting, it's, you know, all that stuff you have to do to run a business uh, for, was a problem for people coming into the legal market and then experience trust navigating government bureaucracy after that history of policing, extreme policing. Uh, around cannabis here in Oakland. Next slide. So we designed a program called the Equity Cannabis Equity Licensing Program that had a bunch of really uh, uh, innovative ideas in it to help address those barriers, equity incubators, which is shared space, phased licensing uh, for equity applicants and general applicants, restricted background checks, so we didn't, do de we didn't restrict people from having a cannabis business if they had a typical cannabis uh, record, city fees waived, cottage cultivation allowed, equity business assistance program, which is business, small business loans made available to people who didn't have access to capital if they qualified under the equity uh, criteria, equity business criteria. And these strategies were all aligned with that racial equity outcome that was established before we knew what we were going to do about it, we established this goal, which you see in the lower right-hand corner, and then we designed the features of the policy to, uh, to further that goal and to address the barriers that were in the way of achieving it. We're still in the process of uh, standing this program up. Much progress has been made. A lot of it has been very encouraging. We're already looking at fine-tuning the program to make it better but it is definitely having a positive impact. We only let eight um, licenses for cannabis dispensaries per year, 
in the city of Oakland. Uh, prior to this program, all of the existing medical cannabis dispensaries, but one, were owned by white residents. The new eight dispensaries that are coming online under this program, five out of the eight are going to be owned by people of color uh, who qualified as equity applicants. And um, the same is happening in other areas of uh, cannabis production and cultivation. So we're seeing that we are making some progress. It's not perfect, and we certainly still have work to do, but it's pretty exciting. It's also started a national conversation about what should be done around cannabis policy when it is being legalized, you know, newly legalized in different environments. So we get a lot of, uh, lot of contact from other cities in California and elsewhere who now are paying attention to equity in opportunity to make money and own businesses in the cannabis industry. Next slide. I think I'm about out of time, but I think we're at the end. We're very close to it. So that might be it. I can't see the change yet. So basically, we're all about this equity result overall of equity results, liberty and justice for all, with the details being in the programming and the changes that we're making in city government that promotes that general outcome in various program locations across the city, not just cannabis. This is just an easy story to tell. It's nice and concise, but we're looking in all areas of city business for op bus lines of business for opportunities to promote equity in the work that we're doing. I think that's it. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Darlene, for presenting and, and definitely really liked um, moving into the equity piece of the conversation and providing that very concise example of what this work can produce in communities um, around the country. So we are a little bit over time, so we will not have time for question and answers, uh, but if you all would like to um, send them our way, we can definitely get them answered from Darlene and Nolan. Um, we'll be sending a follow-up email right after the webinar. It will include a recording. It will include the PowerPoint. Um, we've also included the Philadelphia Workforce Diversity Profile, Oakland's Equity Indicators Report, and a way for you all to watch the Power of Illusion documentary. So you'll be getting all of that in a follow-up email, and uh, we will get you connected with Darlene and Nolan to answer any questions if you respond to that email. Um, so thank you again to Nolan and Darlene, and thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you.